Hello, it's Katie Forrestal coming back to you with the final in my series on 10 common sense reasons to to reject pornography. And I'm not saying I'm not going to do any more of these videos, but for now I'm going to um, put a hold on them unless I get people who really want me to keep doing them because all this information can be found at rejectpornography.com. I'm in the middle of writing a book. I have about four and a half chapters on there. And as I continue, I will let you know that there's more. But you can find it all there and you can read it also. But some people don't like to read, so I thought I'd do the videos and you can just listen. So we have been going through chapter two in the last few videos. And chapter two is very complicated and takes a lot of time and um, absorbing to get all the information because we are talking about theologies um, in America of not only um, well it started with prostitution we talked about prostitution and um, how America has looked at prostitution compared it to how other countries look at prostitution and then moved on to um, going all the way back to the 1800s and ideologies from the Victorian period up until now and how some of it has been rejected um, the Victorian period by people like Hugh Hefner and um, Alfred Kinsey as we talked about who thought they were having bringing forth a new revelation because they felt they had been so hurt by some of these ideas but what I'm trying to say is let's not throw out the baby with bathwater because they had some really good ideas back then too but I also understand people's pain if if there was repression and there was hypocrisy and all those things. So what I'm trying to do is balance the two out here and help you decide for yourself. Um, we went through a lot of legal cases, which is very complicated. There's at least six pages in there on a chart of legal cases that outline the obscenity clause from the 1800s till now. So um, that takes a lot of study in itself. I only outlined them. There's probably more cases, but there's enough there to give you an idea of how much things have changed and how they developed. And so we're going to end today in this chapter with sort of summing all this up. And um, I don't know if I mentioned sex education because there was a brief part in there about sex education because um, a lot of the legal things that have to do with obscenity um, have to are important to sex education in America and how they handle that also. So we talked a little bit briefly about that two videos ago. We're going to go back to that essay that I talked about in the last in that video um, on sex education and the liberal point of view that this man in this um, essay is trying to bring forth. It's, it looks to me like an agenda, and I don't think he's the only one, but he's part of a group that would like to see things go a certain way as far as sexuality in America. And um, I just think we need to be aware of these things, and we need to be watching out for our children. Like I've been saying from the beginning, there's a lot of prey predatory marketing practices aimed at our children, and it's through the media, through literature, through um, the entertainment industry, and through sex education, all these places. We need to be really careful about what's going on, and we need to stand up against things that we don't want. So I'm going to finish this chapter, and if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to... Um, message me. I can send... or here either here on YouTube or at rejectpornography.com and um, if it gets to be too long of a message we can find another way to communicate because I really want to answer all the questions that you have all right so moving on end of chapter two after all the charts as you can see obscenity has been a much debated and complicated issue many of the early cases involve literature hence the term literati came to be in the mid-1960s, Maurice Gerardias, publisher of the Olympia Press and promoter of so-called high pornography, considered pornography as art, mandating the truth about life, mandating, quote, the truth about life must be told. No matter how indecent, unseemly, or ugly it is, and that artists as heroic seers and cultural outlaws deserve special dispensation from society. I can see where Kinsey and um, Hugh Hefner might have got some influence there. 
Another quote, writing dirty books was generally considered a professional exercise as well as a necessary participation, even an active duty, in the fight against the square world. What exactly the squirrel world was, nobody could explain with any precision, but the notion was very strong, and it was not the usual routine of the new generation picking a quarrel with the old. It was a much stronger and deeper protest. As Jared Diaz boasted, quote, the colorful banner of pornography was as good as any other to rally the rebels. The more ludicrous the form of the revolt, the better it was. As the result would go against ordinary logic, ordinary good taste, restraint, and current morals, end quote. It is possible, then, or is it possible, then, that the revolt's only true aim was shock value? In other words, they had an agenda. Many of the later court cases mentioned above were influenced by an article written by William Lockhart and Robert McClure entitled Literature, the Law of Obscenity, and the Constitution, 1954. This was clear in Justice Douglas's dissent to Judge Brennan's ruling on U.S. v. Roth, 1956 case. Justice Douglas referred to Lockhart and McClure as two outstanding authorities on obscenity. Now, these were people from the party of exposure. Even though the work was clearly biased toward the exposure party, Justice Douglas did not agree with the idea of community standards because he connected the community to the party of reticence and felt that they would stagnate anything new through censorship, therefore restricting future generations from growth. I hear a lot about pro progressive ways of doing things. Progression isn't always what, it's, what they say it is. <laughs> he was also not convinced that there was enough evidence to show that it the exposure of the evils of mankind was harmful to the public. He stated, quote, the absence of public information on the effect of obscene literature on human conduct should make us weary. Ironically, the party of exposure relied on the Kinsey Report as the greatest authority of sexual behavior. As one reformer put it, quote, the Kinsey Report has done for sex what Columbus did for geography. End quote. As we learned, they were deceived. They became the host for the parasite and unknowingly spread the poison. It is clear to see that competing ide ideologies have been passed down and are at war. Instead of fighting each other, we might try using some common sense boundaries to find solutions to our nation's ills. It is usually the extremes that cause the most devastation. All right. Conclusion for chapter two, going back to the opening quote that stated the media should teach our children. Okay, that's not the opening quote of chapter two. Uh, that's the opening quote of this section of the book, just to, just to um, not confuse you there. Um, let us explore some other ideas this author of this very well-written and researched paper has about what is wrong with the conservative view of sexuality. And this is where I'm going back to the sex education part. And this um, paper was written by Carl Lee McKinney. It's called Sex Ed, Pedagogy, Pornography, per Precocity, and Adolescent Sexual Subjectivity, written in 2014. All right, so this is a quote from his paper. Um, he's talking about the facts of life, and that was a term that actually was um, coined in the, I think it was the 18 or 1900s, but um, there's a lot of history in this quote, so again, you might have to go back and study it, but I'm just trying to get to sort of the essence of what he's saying. Okay, quote, the facts of life were fundamental, fundamentally shaped by the Protestant white male heterosexual and middle class values of those who created them at the turn of the 20th century in the interest of protecting the young. Some of these facts are that the purpose of sex is biological reproduction and thus heterosexual coitus is the natural expression of sexual behavior that pursuing sex for pleasure is potentially pathological, that healthy and natural sexual relations are monogamous, that males are natural sexual aggressors driven by a bio biological need for physical release, that females are naturally passive and submit to sex only for the sake of children and family, that adolescent sexual behavior is dri driven by raging hormones, that social pro progress depends on judicious mating, 
That superior people are able to rationally suppress the sexual impulse and that inferior races, classes, and categories of people are controlled by their sexual desires. In 20th century America, then, the birds and the bees provided a way to impart to the young a prophylactic knowledge that served both practical eugenics and the progressive cause by defining sexual behavior in terms of a social structure favoring men, marriage, and monogamy, and disfavoring miscegenation, class mixing, promiscuity, and homosexuality, end quote. The author has done his research, and he clearly states his point of view, but there is always a slant on academic papers, quote, good qualitative research contains comments by the researchers about how their interpretation of the findings is shaped by their backgrounds, such as their gender, culture, history, and social um, economic background, end quote. Until one does the research for him or himself and takes each one of the references and reads them thoroughly, he cannot come to the same conclusions as the author. However, many people just accept academic material as fact, partly because it is too much work to read all the references and partly because it is easier to let someone else do the work. The fact is, science and academia do not have all the answers either. Let us look at the above pack passage using some intellect and some common sense. It is possible that the Protestant white men had a large part in forming the ideology of the 20th century view of sexuality, and some may even have had unhealthy prejudices, which is clearly evident in the eugenics movement. However, let us not throw out the baby with the bathwater and consider that some of their ideas could be considered factual and helpful for society. In order to do this, let's review some of the so-called facts of life stated in the previous quote. 1. Heterosexual coitus is the natural expression of sexual behavior. Okay, by saying the natural expression of behavior, they're in the facts of life, it seems to me that they are clearly referring to the biology of the male and female reproductive section system. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or a pornography video to figure out what goes where and why. One could argue otherwise, but in simple terms, the bodies of the genders are designed in a very specific way for procreation. Two, pursuing sex for pleasure is potentially pathological. While the fact that sex is pleasurable does not rebuke the fact that pursuing sex for pleasure is also potentially pathological. This has been clearly proven to be true in pornography and other sex addictions. Three, healthy and natural sexual relations are monogamous. Calling monogamous sexual relations, wait, calling monogamous sexual relations natural could def definitively be argued by looking at the studies on the rise of STDs when promiscuity is increased. On the other side of the coin, if the Victorians truly believe that the males are natural sexual aggressors driven by a bi biological need for physical release, that females are naturally passive and submit to sex only for the sake of children and family, that adolescent sexual behavior is driven by raging heart hormones, one could argue those points as well. That statement does disregards temperaments. It stereotypes genders and puts most everything in the physical, disregarding a holistic approach to sex. Clearly, we can't trust fully the author's argument as a balanced view of sexuality, nor should we take his advice to let the media teach our children about sex. Another passage from the paper clearly shows his slant, or what might be considered bias. This is his summary of the facts of life. Due to a morbid modesty and Victorian prudery, children were learning that sex was dirty and shameful, but rather than repressing the sexual impulse that this shaped it into dirty and shameful sexual behavior. To be able to make the intelligent choice of sexual self-control, adolescents would need an education that builds up from early childhood the attitude, tastes, desires, ideals, and habits which made for sound character. By presenting a biological and evolutionary and inherently eugenic model of sex that defined it in terms of strategic reproduction, scientific sex education would 
inoculate a healthy understanding of sex as natural and foster sexual behavior orientated strictly toward a rational decision to procreate. This author's interpretation of sex education in the Victorian area seems to discredit the party of reticence as having anything worthwhile to bring to sex education and then uses the error of the eugenics movement to make all of the old views of sex sexuality seem harsh and prejudiced. Although we need to be careful not to regress to places of discriminatory practices, liberal views are not always progressive. Sex education, just as policies on obscenity, should be based on what's best for society as a whole. The media is no place for sex education. This author and every other author, artist, politician, judge, or common person has a perspective. All of their opinions count, but they count, but they cannot all be accommodated. Pulling the reins on the pollution that is spreading through the media and entertainment can have a major impact on the future of America. Every nation has boundaries. Every nation has a moral code. It is up to we the people to make our voices known. Are we willing to decrease the demand and cut off the supply of pornography for the sake of our children and future generations? Let us continue to explore some more common sense reasons to reject pornography and then decide for ourselves. Have a great day.